So the, the title of my presentation is uh, uh, Reading and Understanding Preclinical and Clinical Papers. And uh, preclinical is smaller than clinical because I will focus uh, mainly on uh, clinical pa papers on clinical research. And uh, you know, before entering the main topic of this, uh, this presentation, I would like to show my background and said that's the main reason to discuss about clinical research. I'm an internist, expert in thrombosis and hemostasis, and I was EBM trained, uh, such as uh, almost as all physician during the School of Medicine, I guess all over the world, and I will discuss briefly about the EBM. And uh, as a scientist, uh, I'm interested in clinical research in uh, research methodology, uh, of course, or uh, EBM. So uh, what I mean for EBM, what I mean for clinical research methods, what I mean for clinical study, what I mean, what the scientific community mean. EBM is uh, a an important step in uh, medical education and in uh, practicing uh, the medicine. EBM uh, means uh, evidence-based medicine. That's, that's the, the, the first manuscript published in JAMA, so almost 20 years ago, that stated that new approach to teaching the practice of medicine is necessary. Uh, the evidence-based medicine was invented in Hamilton, Canada, at the McMaster University. Um, the history say that uh, David Sackett is the father of uh, the evidence-based medicine, but the uh, author, the main author of this manuscript is Gordon Guyatt. So both of them were physicians, were interested in statistic, clinical epidemiology, and the term clinical epidemiology was something like invented by David Sackett. And why is necessary now to practice medicine evidence-based? Because we need uh, some prove in Italian, so we need evidence, we need data, to give our patient the best treatment, the best diagnosis, and also the best data on etiology and also on prognosis. In the past, medicine was based on sometimes on dogma, uh, also nowadays. For example, some people believe that natural is best. There are some non-conventional medicine uh, known traditional medicine that believes that some kind of intervention are better, such as based on nothing, based on not on data. An example, natural is best. That's, uh, I don't know, also for every aspect of life, of life. For example, food, some say that biological uh, or bio some foods from directly for the country are best than the food created in the industry. That's true, I don't know, but natural is not always the best. Skin cancer is provoked by sunlight and ultraviolet is really natural. And if you eat an amanita phalloide, a mushroom that is completely natural, you will die in a few days. So it's important not to believe only to dogma. And that's uh, in a normal way in the past, but also nowadays uh, to practice medicine. Tradition and convention were always done in this way. In our school, in our department, my chief, my boss, the uh, professor operate in this way due this dosage of this drug. Or everyone in my institution does in this way. Nowadays, we have to practice medicine 
based on data. And this means if you have to practice based on data, we have to produce data. And so it's really important for research that evidence-based medicine is the fundamental of clinical practice because evidence-based medicine encourage the production of good data because now we are the treating physician, but in the future we can be a patient and so we can receive an inappropriate treatment. Evidence-based go to treat the patient, but starts from the search of the literature. So it's really important for physician to understand data published, and it's not easy. It's not easy because it's not easy to translate data on population to data to a single patient because the single patient is really different. In many cases, is different from a patient enroll. For example, in a clinical trial, because you know in, that in a clinical trial, there are inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, so it's the medium man. It's not the man that is uh, bad uh, admitted in my department. That's, it's famous, so the evidence pyramid, that means that we have a lot of data on expert opinion, case series, case report, but this is the low quality evidence. At the top, we have high quality evidence, but low information about uh, for example, randomized control trial, unfiltered information or filter information, such as systematic review. So high quality, low quality, low amount of data, great amount of data at the bottom. And so we have to try to change this theorem at the, the opposite. The last century was uh, incredible, both for medicine and also for clinical method research. I will show you a table published, uh, sorry, I will be back in one second, published uh, two years ago in New England Journal of Medicine. These are the milestones in healthcare intervention and delivery strategy in the 20th century. Something incredible for humanity. So we have antibiotics, we have uh, the cardiac transplantation. We have the discovery of the genes. We have uh, a lot of improvement uh, in patient care. And what happens? In parallel, there was uh, an uh, increase uh, in uh, the quality of uh, research methodology, in particular for clinical studies. Maybe in the preclinical study, there was no so good improvement. And so we started from the first modern large randomized control trial you have seen before. So British medical journals, just a few years after the Second World War, so an antibiotics for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis was a, a placebo control, a randomized control trial. That was the beginning of the modern era of uh, clinical research. And then we have shifted to this new concept of clinical research, the patient-centered outcome research. So a little bit step forward, something like a back to the future step. So what happens in medicine? Uh, Evidence-based medicine in the 90s, we say, oh, evidence is old. We have to uh, find the all possible evidence. So at the center of treating a patient, at the center of doing research is data, is uh, research itself. But some physicians say, oh, that, that's true. But I have to care a patient, and uh, I'm a professionist. I have experience. 
okay data, but in many times data are not enough to treat patients. So we have this new way of seeing research. And from randomized control trial, another step forward is the pragmatic trial. What is pragmatic trial? It's very similar to a randomized control trial, but in a randomized control trial, you measure efficacy. So you measure, uh, for example, how a drug works in a ideal situation, because the randomized control trial is a very ideal situation. Patient is followed for uh, many times uh, in a day, in a month, uh, a lot of tests uh, have been performed on that patient. That's not standard of care. The pragmatic trial measure effectiveness. So it's a, a little bit modification of the method of the randomized control trial and try to test in the usual condition of care if an intervention works better. So we have to randomize patient, we have to control the outcomes, we have to have a, a double blind assessment, but the comparator is standard care. So the control group is not really so similar to the uh, intervention group. That's an example. September 2014, large open label pragmatic randomized control trial the Lancet, one of the main influence journal for treating physician. And there was a shift also in the ABM conception. And so, okay, evidence, but to practice ABM, we have to base also to clinical expertise and so we have to increase clinical expertise and also we have to take care of patient values and preferences. So we cannot force the patient to use a drug because it's the best available and we have to take in consideration that a patient is at the center of their practice. And the last point before entering the main topic of my lecture is uh, what we mean for clinical study. If we, the classical definition is, uh, or many of you have in mind, uh, we have, uh, you have in mind the uh, drug development process. So when we say preclinical, we say a drug tested in animal or an animal model, and then there, will, there is a, a uh, increasing step to FDA approval or the other agency approval. So phase one, phase two, phase three. Now we have also phase uh, zero. Phase uh, five is after the phase four that is marketing. Just a few consideration. Usually this research starts from thousands of drugs to arrive to only one drug approved by the regulatory agency. And usually this process takes more than 10 years. So sometimes 15 years or 20 years. So you can easily understand then the, from the pharmaceutical point of view, you have to spend millions billions of dollars on, uh, and uh, of uh, money to have uh, only one drug after several years available for the market. So it's very easy to have a bias, to have a misconduct. I don't want to judge if this is uh, correct or not, but the risk of bias is very, very high. In the preclinical study, I'm not an expert. Uh, you can do uh, many experiments, uh, especially on the safety of the compound, because you have to switch to a human being. 
you have to be sure that there's no genotoxicity, if there's no reproducive toxicity, if uh, a repeated doses of the drug does not cause uh, adverse events. But that's not enough. We have uh, seen yesterday the example of statics, and uh, nowadays, uh, based on uh, data on uh, preclinical study, maybe statin will never uh, be uh, uh, analyzed uh, in a clinical study. What we mean uh, for phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five? Phase five and phase four are post-marketing, and we need uh, the, the main aim is to identify uh, rare adverse events. Preclinical, just to see if uh, there's no toxicity and uh, the pharmacokinetics and dynamics information. Phase zero, sometimes done in a very small amount of person. Phase one on healthy volunteers, a small amount of person. Phase two on uh, uh, patient, uh, so with a disease, uh, to test uh, both efficacy and safety. And then the, the phase three is the classical randomized control trial that we know that is published usually in New England Journal of Medicine or other relevant uh, journals. And nowadays, uh, for phase three trial are necessary more than a thousand of patients. That means uh, money. That means time. And that's the reason because it's very difficult to have a, a phase D trial not founded by the pharmaceutical company. And that's one another point for discussion. But clinical research is not only drugs. We have to keep in mind that we can test surgery. We can test devices, we can test vaccines, so we can test every therapeutic intervention. And then we can test also other aspects of uh, uh, the practice of physician, not only treatment, but also etiology, also prognosis. That's what we call clinical epidemiology. And you will have a lecture this afternoon uh, about uh, observational study. And uh, on Friday, no, also today on experimental study. So just to remember, clinical study doesn't mean only a randomized control trial, but clinical study means also case control study and cohort study. So in my uh, lecture, I will speak about also of other study. My main topics. If you want to read a clinical paper, you have to find the question, the patient population, the study design, the outcome, the sample size, and the analysis. And uh, these tricks uh, I will try to give you are necessary also for preparing a, a protocol. So. If you are able to read the, the clinical paper, you are able also to prepare a protocol or vice versa. If you are good in preparing a protocol, you know how to find a good clinical paper. If you want to summarize the, the main aim of reading a paper is to find how many bias are present in that paper. What do you mean with bias? Bias is some uh, intended or unintended influence that can make our study result not true. Data doesn't, does not mean true. So some data can use for treating physicians, can use to develop a research, to uh, write another protocol, but if there are some bias, these data cannot be used anymore. You have to close your scientific journal and try to find another one. So 
question. That's the, the main point. When you read the paper, you have to ask to you and ask to the paper which is the, the clinical question. All of you have, uh, uh, let's say when you were in primary school, you were trained to ask uh, your teacher the correct uh, question. And also, if you are in the primary school uh, or research, uh, this uh, PhD program, uh, you have to clear have in mind which is your research question. And for clinical research, uh, uh, the, it's important that uh, the question is focused on uh, unmet clinical need. If you see a paper on uh, a recent journal on uh, the effect of uh, aspirin after myocardial infarction, that's not an unmet clinical need. That's simply a repetition of a previous study. That's uh, only a confirmation of a previous study. So this information is already well known. Just to start, how uh, do you know the four main groups of qu clinical questions that can be found in a clinical paper? A clinical study can be focused on four main group of question. Any physician in the room? Which is the main tasks of a physician? So for taking care of a patient, you have to make a diagnosis. Then. Prognosis, that, that's really important. We have to produce data on prognosis. And when you go to a physician, you ask, oh, I will survive. And the patient, does, the physician doesn't know how to answer to you because you say, oh, I will survive. How many years? Think about cancer. So I have enough time uh, to take care of my children, of my money. That, that's really important to know information about that. So diagnosis, prognosis, then therapy. That, that, that's the main aim. <laughs> Otherwise, we can say uh, no. The, why I had this disease? So the etiology because if I know the cause, I can treat it. So we can have a study about association. We can have a study about diagnosis. We can have a study about prognosis. These are, for example, some study published. Is air travel associated with venous thrombosis? Can a spiral CT diagnose PE? Can the pulmonary embolism severity index score predict for survival, many of my examples are on thrombosis, but I have stated at the beginning my bias on because uh, I usually treat thrombosis disorder. And then the most uh, usual uh, clinical question, the therapeutic question. Does a neural thrombin inhibitor prevent post-operative thrombosis compared to no treatment or low molecular weight tapering? Does this therapeutic intervention better in efficacy and safety than my standard of care? A good therapeutic question includes population, intervention, and outcome. So you have to understand reading the paper or writing a, a protocol if your research question is complete. This paper, this paper is the answer to this question. Do you compare the efficacy and safety of long-term low molecular weight effort with berfarin in cancer patients with acute symptomatic BTE? 
published in New England Journal of Medicine. In the title, so directly in the title, you see the clinical question. Intervention, comparison, outcome, population. That's a perfect title for a, a clinical study. So you do not have to read the abstract. Just reading the title, you know about everything of this study, not the result. So the rule that usually is teached is PICO or PICO. P is the patient, intervention, comparison, and outcome. I have to understand at the beginning of reading of my article what I'm going to read. Because uh, uh, if my patient uh, has not my um, cancer, that, that's not the topic I want to read. That, that's another example. So JAMA, that's not a, a therapeutic study. That's a diagnostic study. Effectiveness, so it's more similar to a pragmatic trial of managing suspected pulmonary embolism using an algorithm combining clinical probability and D-dimer test in computer tomography. That's a diagnostic study. Definitely. No way of discussion. Lancet, aspirin and clopidogrel intervention compared to clopidogrel comparison after recent ischemic stroke and transient ischemic attack population in high-risk patient. Outcome is not reported, but anyway, we can understand from the title the main topic of this article. The other question are not for reading a paper, but to write a protocol. And that's essential. When you write a protocol, or also when you read a paper, you can ask, not in a randomized control trial, of course, but mainly on a case control study, core study. Do I see a clinical biological rationale? It seems to be a, a very stupid question, but we as we have discussed and in the previous day, and I will discuss briefly after my presentation, statistics make do everything. And then sometimes we are looking for p-aching, we are looking for p-value, and sometimes we have the some association that's not really true. And the other question you have to ask to yourself uh, are, is this study clinically relevant? Because otherwise it's not a clinical study. And then I have the necessary money to do the study. I have the necessary time to do the research. And of course, it's ethical to conduct this research. Fortunately, nowadays, uh, there, is, there is some official way to control ethics uh, in clinical research, randomized control trial, but also observational trial, that is the Medical Ethical Committee. So you have, but you have to submit the protocol. Many researchers do not submit the protocol to the Medical Ethical Committee. And also, there are good clinical practice, uh, that was a statement in Helsinki some years ago, how to practice uh, the best uh, clinical methodology for the patient. So, second point, patient population. Uh, we are all different. That's uh, a dogma of humankind. Uh, and uh, it's really important that when I read the paper, I just ask these data are applicable to my patient. So the population study in this study is similar to my patient. Otherwise, you can close your paper and find another article. You have to check for the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and how many patients agree to participate or do not agree to participate. Because in this number, you have to find this number are really relevant. So a picture like this, you have to find in your paper. If you don't find a picture like this, close your scientific journal and find another article. That's really important. 
because uh, we start with a number of patients and then with inclusion exclusion criteria, usually a percentage of patients reach the end of the study. What we have to look, age, if a, a study has been done in young male, I cannot use, I guess, that drug for an elderly woman because age and gender are different. Also, race is important. A study tested in Japanese patients is useful for my patients here in Italy. Or the disease, it's simple to say uh, pneumonia, but uh, pneumonia, how the diagnosis of pneumonia has been done, has been done with uh, a clinical uh, feeling, has been done by CT, has been done uh, with uh, an isolation of uh, bacteria, and also severity. We know that some pneumonia occurs uh, in elderly patient, or we have uh, acquired community pneumonia, we have uh, ICU acquired pneumonia, we have uh, uh, inhalation, inhalation pneumonia, we have different kind of pneumonia. So it's the same, the disease that is uh, included in this study of my patient. And also outpatient, inpatient. So I've been including patient admitted in the hospital or which are usually more complicated. And that's for the drug, it's really important to know the renal function and the hepatic function because many drugs are metabolized by the liver and many drugs are excreted by the kidney. So if my patient have a reduced renal function, in many of the clinical study on new drugs, these patients are excluded. So I don't know if it's of benefit, that drug, and I don't know the best uh, drug dosage. And then, of course, please find if a signed informed consent has been asked to the patient. Otherwise, if you don't find an informed consent ask, close your scientific journal and find another paper. Study design. It's important that you clearly understand the study design of your paper. And uh, which study design we can have? Let's start from this uh, slide. You have to ask yourself which, if the intervention is present or not, and uh, the time of uh, your study. Intervention. I'm doing something to change the reality, to change the natural course of the disease. That's an experimental clinical study. I do nothing. I can only, only I want only to see what's going on. That's an observational study. If I take a video of my patient, I'm doing a, a longitudinal study. If I want to take a picture of my patient, that's a cross-sectional study. So I'm looking at that time what's happening. A longitudinal may be prospective or retrospective. So retrospective is typically the case of the case control study. And I will show you in details in the next figure. So, I'm doing uh, an active treatment. Yes, no, no observational study. There is a, a control group. Yes, analytical study, no descriptive study. Descriptive study are case report, case series. Analytical study, which direction of time, core study from the exposition to the clinical events, case control study, starting from the disease back to the risk factor or cross-sectional study that can be both analytical and descriptive. Experimental, control group, no. Non-uncontrolled trial, 
Yes, has been the treatment assigned randomly to the patient. So no, no randomized controlled trial. Yes, randomized controlled trial. That's very easy. Each clinical question, that's the base, that's the start of your reading, has a best study design. So if you are reading a paper on a question, a therapeutic question, please find that this study is a randomized controlled trial. Otherwise, close your paper and find another, another one because that's the best study designed to answer a therapeutic uh, treatment. I will uh, discuss a little bit later if it is always the best study design. But ideally, that's the best study design. In which case is not the best study design? Dr. Donadini, help me. <laughs> yes, well, for a rare disease, for example, many genetic diseases, how to randomize patients when patients all over the world are very few. That's really difficult to uh, perform a randomized control trial. It will take a lot of time, a lot of money, or otherwise when the outcome is very rare. And so that, that's not always the best trial design from the methodological point of view. So that's uh, the example we have seen in advance. And so in the title, we can say, so the question is a therapeutic question. It's a good study design. It's a good study design. Randomized, double blind, placebo controlled try. So it seems to be this study good from the methodological point of view, at least for question, and at least for the population, and at least for study design. But we have to see another point, such as statistical issues. Outcomes. So outcomes, that, that's only for joke. If you know surgery, surgeon, that, that's really real life. What is outcome? What is the main problem about outcomes. The main problem is to decide if I have to use a clinical outcome or if I have to use a non-clinical outcome. So what are you saying? You are speaking about uh, clinical studies and you want to use non-clinical outcome or what is called surrogate markers in a bad way just to say, oh, it's not good, not clinical outcome. Let's discuss together if it's always not good. If, you want, if I want to study venous thromboembolism, that is pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis, I can use these clinical outcomes, re really relevant clinical outcomes for the patient. So death, no discussion about death. Fatal PE, symptomatic PE, or symptomatic DVT. But in many studies, this uh, outcome MB have been used. So venographic DVT. So after surgery, if you, I, I don't know your background, but everyone knows uh, that after a surgical intervention, usually patient uh, take an antithrombotic to avoid uh, uh, thrombotic uh, thrombosis in the vein eh, because there is a high risk of uh, this complication. And so all the study that have demonstrated that is uh, uh, more efficacy, is the, the, the efficacy and uh, the safety is better than placebo are based on the uh, demonstration of an asymptomatic thrombosis in the distal vein. Nowadays, uh, is used sometimes uh, echography, the ultrasound, to demonstrate that there is a, a thrombosis, non-clinically relevant, or we can use also a, t a CT scan of the, of the lung to diagnose a pulmonary embolism. And sometimes we can use also 
some coagulation test just to see if the coagulation is set. Of course, the first list of clinic of uh, outcomes are better than non-clinical outcomes, at least from the point of view of the patient, because in that case, I don't feel anything if I am a patient. So I, I, I'm not ill. But if from some point of view, a needle icon should be clinically relevant, should be with high prevalence, should be easily measurable, not, it's not always possible to find in any disease and in any situation all these uh, ideal characteristics. Think about, a, fortunately, a disease with a low risk of mortality. If the risk of mortality is less than 0.001%, how many years we have to follow the patient to demonstrate a superiority? So mortality is not always possible to use, fortunately, for many diseases. The high prevalence, that's the same concept of a low risk of mortality. When an outcome has a low prevalence, I need a huge amount of patient to be included. My sample size needs to be very, very large. So it's not always possible to use a clinical outcome if the prevalence is low. Low incidence, large sample size, increased study duration, high relevance of missing patients. If I include the thousand of patients, and the risk of follow, uh, the risk to lost this patient to the follow-up is very, very high. So that's really important. And also, you, I, we have to recognize that every diagnostic test uh, is not optimal. So every diagnostic test, also biopsy, has the false positive results and then also the false negative results. So if I can find a non-clinical outcomes when the, 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 the test to identify this non-clinical outcome as an eye test accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, is less invasive for the patient. Of course, uh, a, bios, a biopsy, for example, a biopsy of the liver, as a, some risk of complication, also fatal complication. And if I can take a blood sample, it's really better for the patient. And uh, that's another point that it's necessary to use non-clinical outcomes. Natural history of the disease is clear. So for the venous thromboembolism, uh, the natural history is clear. So usually the thrombosis starts from the leg, and then there is an embolus to the lungs. And so in that case, we can use also non-clinical outcomes. Of course, if you are a patient, look in the paper about mortality, but because for you it's really relevant to be alive or to be dead, and then you have to be highly critical about combined outcomes. And I will not discuss about combined outcomes, but if you combine outcomes, what happens is that your sample size decreases because combining outcomes increase the prevalence of the outcomes, and so in that case, you reduce your sample size. And that's my next topic to discuss. So uh, we cannot study the whole population, the whole Italian population with hypertension, so we have to take a sample, and we have uh, to take a sample that is representative uh, of the, or the population and to uh, ideally have the same condition. To calculate the sample size, uh, we will need at least these four variables. So alpha error, beta error, event estimates, uh, and the effect size. What is alpha error, beta error, event say, effect estimates? That is standard. It does depend on, on you, on the research. Alpha error is the probability 
to conclude for an effect when it is not. So these are the false positive results. That's the famous p-value. So the 5%, every clinical study usually have a 5% probability to say that there is an effect when it's not true. That's for definition, for convention, because the calculation of sample size, it's only an uh, algorithm performed by st statistical software. That's the reason that the p-value usually is less than 0 0.05. Beta error, beta error has something with, uh, to have uh, its relation with the statistical power. It's exactly the same, it's the probability to conclude for a lack of effect when it is. So false negative results. Usually is 20%. That's a convention. You can have uh, also a study when 1% uh, false positive. If you want to have uh, an alpha error of 1%, what happens to your sample size? Increase or decrease? Increase dramatically. If you choose a 5%, uh, sorry, a 10%, the sample size decrease. But I will ask you, you will take a medicine, a pill, a drug with a 10% risk not to be effective? No, you will never take that. Beta error usually per definition is 20%. We are a little bit uh, less conservative because we can say no effect. And that's important when just another treatment is available for a physician. But two others elements are important. We just know. So the prevalence, the incidence, uh, it's better to say the incidence uh, of the events, uh, and also, uh, we have to estimate uh, the effect of a new drugs. Let's see this example. If we estimate uh, that the benefit uh, of the new drugs uh, intervention decreased by 50% uh, the event uh, in the intervention group in comparison with the control, 50%, 50%. Look how the sample size change depending on the frequency of your event. So, high prevalence, low number to be included of patient, low prevalence, high number to be included. So that's really important, how we select the outcomes. If data are primary embolism outcomes, that's the reason why sometimes uh, we use non-clinical outcomes. That's right ventricular dysfunction, usually measured by ultrasound of the heart. That's, that's another reason because researchers try to use non-clinical outcome with high prevalence. So a really huge difference in patients to be included. Of course, I want to know about mortality, but I have, I need money and I need time. The other reason, that's very simple, intuitive, it's the, the, the coin rule. So you know, if a million of time you take a coin, you have the 50 percent to have a cross, but if you take a coin all of only for 10 times, it's possible, and all the 10 times you have a cross. And uh, if you stop there, your experiment, you will publish your data, but these data are not true. So you have to say in advance, how is your sample size? 
And so you have to read also in the paper that they have calculated in advance the sample size. That's really important. Because all is based on the stat know, statistical assumption. Last point is analysis. With statistics, you can do everything. You can do everything with the software, but also if you are a smart statistician, you can find every association you want to find. Just briefly, it's important that you read which population is analyzed, if adjustment for possible confounder has been done, if it's a subgroup or secondary analysis, and then just few seconds about non-inferiority or superiority trial that is a not topic in the clinical research, in particular in ethical. We have two analyses for randomized controlled trials, usually. The so-called intention to treat and the per protocol analysis. Which is the best? Marco, which one you will read? Okay, good, good answer. <laughs> and let's say that many patients will not uh, follow all the rules of the protocol for many reasons. And so we have a, uh, a population that is, uh, of course, a subgroup of the overall population that is defined per protocol. So the perfect patient, the ideal patient, that in an ideal randomized control trial have done everything in the good way. So the per protocol analysis uh, uh, estimate really the efficacy. We need the efficacy or the effectiveness. So the statistical point of view, the intention to treat analysis that include the old patient, also patient lost to follow up because we don't know the reason those patients were lost. They can move to another country or can be dead. And we don't know. Or an adverse event can of course. So the intention to treat analysis try from the statistical point of view to provide the effectiveness. So a measure of the real life. And so for the patient, it's really important to know from the intention to treat analysis what happens. And then it's important, uh, directly related, that we read in the paper the withdrawals. So not analyzing the per protocol analysis. And we, we have, we required, and also the editor of the journal needs that the authors of the paper should uh, write uh, how many patients were not compliant with the therapy? Because if a therapy was not taken, taken for a large amount of patients, I cannot use in the clinical practice. How many were lost to follow up? If they were outliers, if they were excluded, how many outliers? You can not analyze in the per protocol the outliers, but you have to declare. So I know if outliers have been excluded or were included in analysis. Then what is called data exploration or uh, secondary analysis or sub-analysis. What is that? It's an analysis not directly related to the principal hypothesis. So we have uh, understand that uh, to Perform a clinical trial, we have to calculate the sample size. The sample size is usually calculated on one outcomes. So that's a study designed only for that outcomes. What can I uh, do? For example, I can do X an analysis, uh, that's the positive point of view of data exploration. And additional analysis can generate new hypotheses. Oh, well, that's good. If there is a biological rationale, if there is an underlying clinical rationale, or for example, for a test, I can find a new cutoff point. So for a blood 
test and can say, oh, the D-dimer more than is more accurate for that kind of population, for example, for elderly patients. But we have a lot of cons of data exploration. The first has been discussed also by Professor Cosentino, the peak aching, or we say in, in clinical study, the fishing for p-value. Because uh, uh, from the statistical point of view, if you repeat uh, an analysis 20, 20 times, uh, per definition, what analysis is positive. Why am I saying that? Because it's exactly the five it's the alpha error. So from the statistical point of view, if I repeat several times, per definition, I will certainly found a p-value less than 0.05%. And that's, it should be avoided. Otherwise, I'm doing a p-value only for publish my Non-inferiority and superiority. I don't know if you have uh, heard about uh, this discussion, but that's mainly about randomized control trial. Usually, randomized control trial have been designed to demonstrate that one drug, one surgery, one uh, intervention is better than, is superior to. In the last years, uh, we were uh, facing an increasing number of trials using a non-superiority design. What does it mean? Superiority means a, a treatment in which the upper limit of the confidence interval is at the left part of the no effect. Equivalence of the new treatment and the standard treatment, uh, the confidence interval cross zero line or the one line, it depends what you use, uh, odds ratio or in, the, in this case, event risk difference. Non-inferiority, what does it mean? It's a new intervention in which the upper limit of the confidence interval usually is the 95% confidence intervals is minor than a delta. So if you assume that it's non-inferior, it's not really equivalent, but it's not upper this limit. And so, from the statistical point of view, which is the benefit, not from the clinical point of view, which is the benefit of doing uh, such different comparison? The sample size decrease. The sample size decrease because uh, I need many, many patients, more many patients to demonstrate that it's better. Okay, I have to reduce the wide of the confidence interval to be all of the left. In that case, I can have also a wide confidence interval, and I can say with minor uh, number of patients. So that's the advantage for with performing a trial. So less time less money, less patient included. Is that ethical to do that? That's famous. So Professor Garattini, the chief of the Mario uh, Negri Institute of Milan, wrote this editorial in Lancet in 2007 and say, known inferiority trials are unethical. So say, I will never perform in non-inferiority trial, I will never read non-inferiority trial. I don't know your position, but my position is uh, more in line with the one of the answer to the uh, Garattini paper. Uh, a group of uh, UK physician who say, "Oh, Professor Garattini, please, if I will perform." a trial on tuberculosis, and uh, I will demonstrate the uh, period less than six months of therapy 
is non-inferior to a period of six months and more or antibiotic therapy for tuberculosis because you know that to treat tuberculosis, you have to take several drugs for several months. Of in that case, I will reduce adverse events and I will save money to be used for taking care of other patients, especially in developing countries where the tuberculosis has the high frequency. So, in some cases, it could be used and it could be ethical to use non-inferiority. And that's the position of the uh, Italian regulatory agency about non-inferiority trial. They say, we, the, the researcher, can use uh, this uh, uh, trial design if the treatment is more safe, is the advantage in compliance cost, there is a advantage in formulation, or something like that. I'm not sure that all this uh, advantage uh, justify a non-inferiority trial, but for the case of tuberculosis, I work for the UK physician. But non-inferiority is not an ethical issue. It's also a statistical issue. And uh, I will show a, uh, let's say, uh, ideal result uh, of uh, non-inferiority trial. So these are the, all the possible results from a, a non-inferiority. So in the first case, uh, we can say, oh, oh, maybe the new drug is better. In the second case, we can say, oh, it's better, but it's not superior because cross the line. In the third case, we can say, oh, it's equivalent just on the line. We can say it's not superior, but uh, is uh, non-inferior. But in the last case, it's at the birth time uh, inferior and non-inferior. So it's really important to read the result and to see also the picture, because you have an idea what's going with that molecule, with that new drug. So that's also important, not only to say no need. So that's my show, very easy now. So that's a, a famous, worldwide famous Italian case. So um, the association between chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency and multiple sclerosis. So famous because uh, I will say that is scientifically good. I will demonstrate briefly because it's good. That's the Zamboni method. So a surgeon in Emilia Romagna say that he can treat uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, an opening uh, the vessel, the vein vessel of the neck and head. And there was a lot of criticism on him. But what did he say? In a court way, he said, OK, I believe in my theory. I see the biological rationale. So he went to the Cochrane, Italian Cochrane collaboration, and designed a trial that is ongoing. And say, OK, let's test in the best way and so that's Damboni published with uh, Filippini, Roberto D'Amico, also the name of Alessandro Liberati. So he say, okay, give me your best uh, clinical methodology and I will do the trial because I really believe in my hypothesis. And so it was designed a randomized controlled trial. That's modern medicine. So that's the genetic disorder it's, uh, that's uh, a, a new genetic disorder discovered in 1965, so yesterday, let's say. And so this pediatrician came to Italy in Verona in a, a museum. See this uh, picture? I saw a boy with a puppet and say, oh, I have three patients like that. 
and he described for the first time the Angerman syndrome, called them the happy puppet. So, medicine is also a research, is also case report. And I can cite also the HIV experience. And that's really for fun. And the BMJ, a few years ago, I don't remember, 10 years ago, some, some people perform a systematic review. So we have seen the systematic review at the top of the evidence and say, okay, let's find in the literature all the evidence that paracute prevent that major trauma. And they conclude that no trial, randomized controlled trial, has been performed on the efficacy and safety of paracute. And so they say, okay, please, all the radical protagonists of the evidence-based medicine organize the trial and most of all be the participant in this trial, in this double-blind randomized controlled trials to paracute with no paracute. Thank you for your attention.